all sing uh, parts of the song and, and he, you know, make an orchestration out of uh, a simple little song with everybody in the audience uh, singing whether you want to do it or not, you find yourself singing a part and it'd be beautiful. He's a living testament to the First Amendment and, you know, you can't just say you have rights. You have to use them to prove that you have them. Pete stood for justice. He had powerful enemies who wanted that voice of justice to go away. But he stayed and kept singing. Pete was one of those guys that saw himself as a citizen artist, as an activist. He had a very full idea about those things, how it connected to music and what music could do. The power that music had to influence, to inspire. And that's the power of folk music, and that was the power of Pete Seeger. time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time to weep. Do everything, turn, 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 there is a season, turn, 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 and a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to build up, a time to break down A time to dance, a time to mourn A time to cast away stones A time to gather stones together Do everything Turn, turn, turn There is a season Turn, turn, turn And a time for every purpose Under heaven Didn't old John cross the water, walked her on his knees? Didn't old John cross the water on his knees? In a sense, my father was a very iconoclastic American, total patriot absolutely unrecognized for this by many people, and it's his patriotism that was terribly misunderstood. He built this house right behind me with his own hands. We had no running water through my early grade school years, no electricity. He pioneered this place just like he was out on the prairie. And uh, 
he devoted himself to well, what he believed in, which was not only the American people, but the people of the world. His father was a scholar, and uh, he invented the uh, study of musicology. And uh, his mother was a concert violinist. So I would say he grew up with a definite sense of bringing music to the people, and that's what he's always been trying to do. My father spent a year or two in his grandparents' barn building one of America's first automobile trailers. It looked more like a covered wagon. My parents' plan was to take uh, great classical music, Bach and Beethoven, out to the small towns in the countryside. But the trip was a disaster. They ended up camping out in North Carolina. Mother played an excellent violin and father a piano, and they played all kinds of music. And then, of course, the local people said, wouldn't you like to hear our music? The experience changed him forever. Uh, he'd always been open to folk songs, but he'd never been immersed in them as he was that winter. Charlie put it to me this way. He said, for the first time I realized the people had a lot of good music themselves. They didn't need my good music <laughs> as much as I thought. My parents' marriage broke up in the 1920s. His uh, mother was a frustrated musician and uh, finally just said, I, you know, I didn't want to, couldn't take it anymore, and she left. My older brothers and I somehow managed to get scholarships to schools in Connecticut. We spent our summers in our grandparents' barn. What I remember here best was having fun, drawing pictures, playing games. I was a complete fan of American Indians uh, between age eight and 13, and when I read the books of Ernest Thompson Seton. We had the three greatest summers we ever had. Every meal, we sang our hearts out, and we learned to harmonize in every way you can imagine. And my father then got a job in Washington, and uh, hardly ever saw this place again. I was given a ukulele at age eight, and I can tell you all the pop songs of 1927, 28, 29. Silly words, but fun songs. I'd, I'd get the kids in school singing with me. I'm just a sentimental gentleman from Georgia, Georgia. He was a show-off from the beginning, and he delighted people with playing his ukulele and singing to them. Well, pretty soon that wasn't good enough, and he got into banjo. I courted pretty Polly the live long night. I courted pretty Polly the live long night and left her next morning before it was light. I was a teenager. My father took me down to an annual festival of mountain song and dance in North Carolina. My father wanted me to hear this music played by people who knew how to make it. Both my father and I realized that here was, were very skilled musicians. When they played, they were thinking of the sound, and when they played together, they were thinking of each other's sounds. They, just as closely as any string quartet ever did. And this was a great discovery. Well, I suddenly realized what an extraordinary thing the five-string banjo was. Pete got very close to father because of his delight in folk music and father's delight in folk music and uh, Pete, uh, I think father saw Pete as a person to develop that whole area. 
it was my brother Charles and I decided that Pete should go to college, and so that he got into Harvard, and it was a matter of who's going to pay for it. But Charles and I were earning weekly salaries. You, you chipped in, too, to yes. make it possible. If, I, I thought it was Elsie and father and mother, and maybe a little bit from... It was chiefly, chiefly Charles and I. We got a little <laughs> bit from other people. I know I Occasion, you know, occasional gifts. The scholarship and a job and the little my family put together uh, paid for Harvard. And I got involved in the American Student Union, which was a temporary uh, coalition between pacifists and socialists and communists. And we were arguing what to do about Hitler. Some said, don't have anything to do with war, just be a complete pacifist. But the communists said the whole world uh, should, uh, should quarantine the aggressor. And I thought they were right. I ended up joining the Young Communist League and let my mark slip and I lost my scholarship to Harvard. A couple years later, just before World War II, I think I actually joined and became a card-carrying member. I was against race discrimination. The communists were against race discrimination. I was in favor of unions, and communists were in favor of unions. And the communists were having a march down Fifth Avenue. He'd take his banjo and play it, and uh, everybody would sing and say, yes, they marched. And it was the kind of music that uh, people could sing because it was folk songs. In the 20th century, all around the world, middle-class people discovered the beauties of folk songs, and when rec recordings were invented, they put the recordings in their libraries. But in USA, a man named John Lomax did something that nobody else had thought of doing. He took these folk songs that he wrote down with his pencil and paper, and he put them in a book. He wanted Americans to learn these songs. They're great songs, this is a part of America. In the late 1930s, Pete Seeger had the privileged position of working in the Library of Congress with John Lomax and his son Alan Lomax. And he's there, he's doing some recordings, he's meeting people like Woody Guthrie, he's having all these encounters with American folk music. Henry, when he was a baby, sitting down on his mammy's knee, Henry, when he was a baby, Alan Lomax, the folklorist, who says, Woody, you've got to come down to Washington and let me record uh, your life story. And I was working for Alan Lomax down there, and Woody found that I could accompany him in any song he sang. I knew exactly what chord he was going to hit for, and I didn't try anything too fancy for him, just give him straight back. So he let me tag along after him. He taught me how to ride freight trains. The allure of Woody Guthrie led him on the road, and they hopped freight trains. And I think it was a romantic ideal that he stumbled onto. I don't think he was searching for it. Raggedy, raggedy are we Just as raggedy as raggedy can be Woody and I were trying to put out a book of labor songs called Hard Hitting Songs for Hard Hit People. And I hear about a man named Lee Hayes who's trying to put out a book of labor songs. Lee was living with a journalist named Millard Lampell and somehow my banjo just fitted them and pretty soon the three of us were singing around here and so we became the Almanac Singers 
in the winter of 1941. I wrote to Woody, said, Woody, we've been singing for unions here. We sang in Madison Square Garden for the striking transport workers, 20,000 people. You ought to come east and join us. And a month later, he came to New York and joined the Almanacs. It was a commune of the period. We mostly ate together. We, if anybody earned any money outside, we kicked it into the general living costs. The goal of the Almanacs, if anybody asks us, we want to build a singing labor movement. But we'd barely got started on that job before World War II broke out. All the idea of, of strikes and everything was, we said, after the war's won, then we can think about that. Now I wished I had a bushel, wished I had a peck, wished I had old Hitler with a rope around his neck. Hey, round, round, hit the gray, round, round we go. Our version of Round and Round Hitler's Wave was the first folk song I think that was ever used on nationwide radio during the war. We had a nice collection of songs, but they needed to be uh, put in some kind of alphabetical order. And one of the square dancers that I'd been square dancing with volunteered to help. After a few days or a few weeks, we were in love. When I was drafted into the army of July, about six months later, uh, she said she'd wait for me. And we had letters back and forth between us. And finally, a year later, I realized I was going to get a furlough and I could go back to New York. I said, let's get married. He was walking me home, right, on the east side of Washington Square. And he proposed to me. <laughs> he said, will you marry me? But he didn't get down on one knee, did you? Oh, we were just walking. Uh, we did get married in July of 1943. Toshi has been a tower of strength, putting up with my enthusiasms for this and my enthusiasms for that. Her running joke has been, if only Peter would chase women instead of chasing causes, I'd have an excuse to leave him. When I was a young man and never been kissed, I got to thinking over what I had missed. I got me a girl, I kissed her again. Oh Lord, I kissed her again. Oh, kiss the sweet and wild. Pete was not out home enough to really, to really be more than a visiting father. And Toshi was the home and held it together beautifully. Toshi enabled Pete to be Pete and to play all over the United States while she brought up children. takes to live with a saint, a martyr. And no, no, she's not a martyr. <laughs> Kisses sweeter than Pete Seeger was private first class. His first job in the U.S. Army was repairing aircraft uh, engines. But uh, in the end, Seeger ended up at leading workshops in, and leading song concerts in Saipan in the middle of the South Pacific. And it was there that he hatched the idea of creating a national organization of people who wanted to sing labor songs. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. The idea behind people's songs was to get 
groups of, of socially conscious people, musicians and singers together, to do concerts, which we called hoot nannies in those days. And it was the source of uh, talent that they could use for their meetings. He'd always wanted to do that, turn, turn these unions into singing unions. But almost as soon as the war was over, Roosevelt was dead, Truman took over. We hadn't foreseen the Cold War. And the FBI was in hot pursuit, and when they weren't going through his trash or sticking bugs in the typewriter at the People's Song's office, they were going to the conventions and even planting informants in his uh, organization. There is no room in the government of the United States for any who prefer the communistic system or any other form of absolutism to our American system. One of the ideas of the government was to stop what they called the communist influence in, in the labor movement in the country. And to do that, it needed to find a way to make the Communist Party appear as a foreign, as a foreign agent. They passed the Taft-Hartley bill, which said, uh, you uh, can have all the unions you want as long as you fire all the lefties. Well, they fired the best organizers, and the union movement gradually slid down and down and down and down. Along comes the Henry Wallace 1948 political presidential campaign. I am committed to peaceful negotiations with the Soviet government. Dewey and Truman were not into folk music, that's for sure. Henry Wallace was, that's for sure. And so Pete and Henry hooked up, and they traveled all over the country. Yankee, Russian, white or tan, Lord, a man is just a man. We're all brothers and we're only passing through. I and numerous others tried our best to help get Henry Wallace elected president. Wallace was a peace candidate. He was not a communist. Well, the Wallace campaign really put Pete and folk singing on the national scene. People that you saw me passing through. I used to come out here at 5 o'clock every morning because you got in from the village vanguard at 4 and the children, babies, would wake you up. So I took them out in the park all by myself at 5 in the morning. Never thought of that. Thank you. I have to thank you for everything, for your life, for oh. my life, Slower. for my children's life. Thank oh. you. You have been absolutely extraordinary thank, and thank I thank you, you so much. We lived in the middle of the house. We used to live here 60 years ago. In this building here? Yeah. Right here. The whole house. <laughs> we didn't have the plate glass window then. And where do you live now? 60 miles north. Uh -huh. When 1949, Toshi and I were as broke as any young people could be. But we scraped up a few hundred dollars here and a few hundred dollars there and got some land real cheap. I think you understand from his background that he was kind of a loner in prep school as a kid and he slept out in the woods and I think Rolf in the Woods, if that's the correct name of the book, was a favorite book of his. And I think as an adult, he copied it right here with a wife and kids. I remember there being a little corral right out there where they put me. Mm -hmm. That was my playpen. It seemed huge to me, but I hated it anyway. And uh, I remember when that wall was being built. I remember my mother mixing cement and my father up on the, on the wall. The kitchen was, if you've been in the house, was right behind me here. And there was a wood stove and there was like a wash basin because they hauled the water from the brook. And that's where they cooked and washed the dishes for your kids. My sister was two years younger, except for the winter time. We, we were outside all the time. I slept in that corner right there. My parents slept split level right there to the right of the door. And everyone was in this one place. 
And I think when they wanted more privacy as a young married couple, they kicked us out to that porch outside where we slept in the snow for two or three years until the roof went over that. My mother should get an award for having given up all the things that she might like to have done in her life in order to uh, make sure her husband was successful. Toshi never stopped working. She did it out of love, and she did it for a vision that I don't know if it was hers. I think it may have been Pete's vision. In 1949, the famous concert artist, Paul Robeson, had given some concerts in Peekskill, and now for the third year, the people sponsoring him said, let's get a bigger place. And they got a big field and thought they'd get maybe a couple thousand people there. And Robeson asked me to sing a few songs at the beginning of the concert. In Peekskill, New York, a sign of the times. The pro-Soviet singer Paul Robeson was scheduled to perform, and a surge of anti-communist feeling burst into violence and riot. Well, it had been advertised that the concert was going to be there, and there were vets from all over the country that came here to protest that concert. And, of course, even as teenagers, we were brought up not to like communism, and therefore we were going to protest as well. And the concert took place, I sang a few songs, and then Robeson sang for an hour, and we all congratulated ourselves. When the time came to leave, the people against the, the concert were lined up on the side of the road, and the police played very little role in preventing them, and they, they threw rocks. Around the corner was a pile of stones, waist high, each stone about as big as a baseball. Wham! And then around the next corner, was another pile of stones, wham, from the other side. All I can remember is Takashi, my Japanese grandfather, he shoved my head right down to the floor and just got me out of the line of fire violently and quickly, kabash, my head was jammed, and all I remember is just glass flying everywhere and just a burst, an explosion of glass, and I got there, every window was broken in the car, and it was over in a, in a second. It was a very, very difficult time, and. Uh, and the FBI was all over the place uh, asking questions and uh, uh, generally trying to scare people into inactivity, basically to try to scare people so that they, they wouldn't be active doing the things that they felt were the right things to do. It was around 1949 when I drifted out of the Communist Party. I still have communist friends and I argue with them. Uh, and I occasionally look at their newspaper some good stories occasionally. But then I also get the Wall Street Journal, and there are occasionally good stories there. I'd really like it if I could get them both in the same room talking with each other. Turn up, turn up, turn up, turn up. Can't you hear the music playing in the city square? Turn up, turn up, turn up, turn up. Come where all our friends will find us with the dancers there. Turn up, turn up, join the celebration. There'll be people there from every Dawn will find us laughing in the sunlight, dancing in the city square. Santa, Santa, come and dance the horror. One, two, three, four. All the boys will then be made for Santa. Lee Hayes and I, who'd sung in almanacs, we found a wonderful alto singer and a very good uh, 
guitar player and baritone singer, and pretty soon we had a quartet. And we sounded darn good together. We, it was amazing. And the Weavers got started, and the Weavers hit the big time, my God! It never occurred to us we'd have a hit record. It was totally unexpected. Well, Tsena was going to be the hit side. Decca put its money behind it. Sure enough, it rose right away to number one. Then disc jockeys, just out of curiosity, played the other side. And it was the phenomena of the year 1950. We learned this song, Irene, from a friend of ours. His name was Hudy Ledbetter. He called himself Leadbelly, king of the 12 string guitar. Some people thought he was the greatest folk singer that ever lived in America. We knew him best as a rememberer of folk songs, and he taught us dozens of them. Good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dream. Last Saturday night, I got Within one month, Good Night, Irene we shot up the charts and took over number one. All of a sudden, we were now hot commercial properties, and we got a new manager, and he got us jobs at the biggest nightclubs he could, Ciro's in Hollywood, and the Thunderbird Hotel in Las Vegas, the Palmer House in Chicago, the Waldorf Astoria in New York. He didn't like the fancy hotels that we stayed in. I loved them, but he did not like them, and he usually managed to find usually a friend that he could stay with, and if not a friend, then some flea bag somewhere that he could stay in. Well, I never wanted to do commercial work. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't like nightclubs. The Weavers were at the top of the charts, as they say. Our music being played all over, even covered by people. The Weavers were offered a weekly television show, Coast to Coast, sponsored by Van Camp's Pork and Beans. However, that very week, a little group of blacklisters came out with a blast against us, and Van Camp's Beans did not sign the contract. And as we were then called evil commies, our records were not, no longer played because the disc jockeys were scared. The Weavers were the only group that became blacklisted. And when I went around to people in the music industry, everyone was scared to talk up against the blacklist and just wanted to hide. We lost our, um, our livelihood, we lost our careers, we lost our, you know, but we lost much more than that. We lost the sense that we were living in a democratic society. The censorship that he incurred at a particular point is never as far away as you think it is. What happened to him and, and a lot of those artists at that time, it could happen again. It won't happen the same way. It's, it's more subtle. It's different. Anytime when you have an administration that punishes its enemies, you know, uh, in a very personal fashion, particularly, that's never as far away as you think it is. Well, now some folks say a man is made out of mud. But a poor man's made out of muscle and blood. 1952 and 1953, when he was to come up in front of um, UAC, and our whole family turned upside down. Some of my mother's pupils quit because they didn't want to be associated with the family. Uh, my father resigned before he could be fired. Well, Mr. Sega, you said you'd never engaged in any conspiracy before in your entire life. Do you consider the Communist Party a conspiracy? Uh, the same thing I told Mr. Weldon, my own opinions, how I voted in the election, my own affair. I, I just, I don't like getting arguments about politics or religion for that matter. No, but do you consider people. the Communist Party a conspiracy? I've just given you my answer, haven't I? No, he didn't even admit that he was a communist. He said, I believe in doing what I believe in, and other people believe that, and I have a perfect right to say that it's private. And so he wouldn't tell them.
Uh, Mr. Seeger, you specifically de declined the protection of the Fifth Amendment and are refusing to answer the committee's questions. Can you tell us why? Well, uh, I told the committee that in all my life, I've never committed any kind of act, conspiratorial or even conducive. And uh, I resented the implication that uh, by being called before the committee that because my opinions might be different than Mr. Walters, he has a right to his opinion, I have to mine. Judge Murphy said, uh, I have determined that Mr. Seeger should have answered these questions. So I was declared guilty. However, after seven years, the appeals court acquitted me. And nobody's asked you if you were fearful that you would go to jail. I'm probably very stupid, but I, I'm not fearful. But I, I really believed, and I think I was right, that in the long run, this country doesn't go in for things like that. I was born one morning when the sun didn't shine. I grabbed my shovel and I went to the mine. We got a new manager, Harold Leventhal, who three years later rented Carnegie Hall as a gamble for a Weaver's reunion. And to everybody's surprise, he got standing room only. He filled it. It changed our lives, made a whole new life for us. There was an audience of people who were defying the blacklist to come to hear the Weavers from Carnegie Hall on. One morning in the drizzling rain, fighting trouble in my middle name. You see me coming, you better step aside. A lot of men didn't, and a lot of men died. You load 16 ton, and what do you get? You get another day older and deeper in debt. So uh, however, the Weavers did a commercial for a cigarette company, and I was very much against this. They said, well, we need the money. I said, we don't need the money this much. And I resigned from the Weavers. Late 40s and 50s, Pete was the only banjo player around, up north, at, at, at the very least. Pete was decided that he was going to write a banjo instruction manual. And then he realized that he had never taught anybody how to play the banjo. So he figured he should get some people together and teach them how to play the banjo so that he could know how to, what to write, what was working. And I, I was lucky enough to be one of the people. So he was teaching us everything, how to play rumbas and uh, frailing and uh, picking. Of course, I was desperate to learn everything and play like Pete, because who else was there? Banjo was the tool, it was his weapon, it was his instrument that got the music out there. And for many of us, he was the banjo. I basically pursued Pete Seeger to the point where he couldn't get a job. The only people that he could sing for were kids because they never thought there'd be a problem with Pete Seeger singing for six-year-olds. Little did they know. <laughs> Out of that came not a subversive movement, but instead an American folk music revival that I think we have to give the FBI credit for helping to establish. I was a uh, counselor and a camper for many years at Camp Woodland for children in Phoenicia, New York, an interracial left-wing camp, and Pete came up regularly. They're built in section of people who already knew and liked folk music, who had learned it in the camps, or like my case, taken lessons from Pete and played around Washington Square in New York and Greenwich Village. And we went out to college and we wanted to keep up the same music. So we formed folk music clubs. We got together with other kids who played. Before you know it, you'd have 200 people a week just coming out to sing folk songs with you. So when we brought the king of folk singers, when we brought Pete Seeger out, it wouldn't be 200, it'd be 500, 1,000. I went from college to college to college to college to college from 1953 right into the 60s. 
And the college students believed in freedom of speech, so if you want to pick it, you can pick it. But they weren't going to cancel my concert. And uh, in a funny upside down way, you know, the picketing, all it did was sell more tickets to my concerts. Vilest time for him was the 1950s, when he was blacklisted during the period of HUAC. It was like the blacklist turned over to a, a populace who had just been so fed this anti-communist hysteria. I must have been around, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old, and our school took a trip to go to see a Pete Seeger concert somewhere in Brooklyn. And the school bus pulls up, and the little kids got out. And out in front of the theater, are all these guys marching around with signs saying, don't go, he's a commie. And I'm saying, oh, wow. I went up to the guy and said, you know what? Is he really a commie? He said, oh, yeah, he's a commie. I said, give me those pamphlets. Kids, let's all get pamphlets. So we got all the pamphlets, and then we walked inside. And they didn't have any more pamphlets. And that was our first <laughs> political action that was sort of based on a Pete event. In 1962, when I was acquitted of the charge of contempt of Congress, my wife and I decided to take a trip around the world. The world trip was my father's brainstorm to take his whole family on the road for a year, yank him out of school, and going to as many countries as it could possibly be fit in. We took a cheap newsreel camera with us, and we filmed some of the most extraordinary music and dancing all around the world. The films were scholarly attempts at documenting music. My mother was the camera person, and I did the sound. And, uh, and we saw a piece of the world that no longer exists. To pay for the airline tickets, which wasn't cheap, I think he performed in every country. His idea was to get the world singing, not to be the singer. was everywhere. The seed, the Johnny Apple seed of Pete Seeger, was planted and grew and grew and grew. genesis of the folk revival. It was his spirit and his um, way of embracing folk music as a, a tool for justice and consciousness and caring that became the model for all of us. Pete Seeger is probably singularly the most responsible person for making this a national identity. <laughs> 
He, more than anybody, reintroduced America to its musical heritage. The Newport Folk Festival was set up to present rural folk music to an urban environment. And it was incredibly successful at taking performers of folk music, some traditional, some city billies, and presenting it to a new audience of young people. Starting in 63 through 69, with some of the greatest musical experiences that this country has ever seen, the world has ever seen. The point is, nobody could have gotten that kind of, of support from the entire, uh, I'll use the word folk world, but it wasn't all a folk world because there were a lot of commercial artists that would give up days of their lives where they could have made big money to come up and play on the folk festival. But Pete was the leader. The first folk festival was mainly well-known performers. So we sat down and wrote a long letter to George. We said, George, do you realize you could have a festival that would be a real folk festival next summer? Because you'd have old timers from the country contrasting with the young timers from the colleges. The Newport Folk Festival was kind of the official birth of folk music going from countercultural to being a part of the culture. I thought folk music was yeah, delivering me something, you know, uh, which was uh, which the way I always felt about life, you know, and people and uh, ideology. Walk down. myself as a planter of seeds and uh, as some of them like in the Bible says some of them land in the stones and they don't sprout some land in the pathway and they get stomped on but some land on good ground and grow and multiply a thousandfold the meeting between the folk revival and pop culture got immense, and there was a television show called The Hootenanny Show, so it was reaching a very, very big audience. Sure, just in time for a Hootenanny with the Travelers Three. My experience of folk music when I was a kid was probably the Hootenanny TV show, which, if, I, if I'm correct, he, he, couldn't, he didn't appear on because he was blacklisted. They wanted me on the show, and to this day, it's one of the things I'm really very, very proud of. I said, oh, I'd be delighted to come on your show as soon as you put Pete on, because he had been not allowed on TV or radio, I believe, what, 17 years? The fact that they didn't want to have me on it unless I would sign a non-communist oath uh, was kind of trivial. But a man in New York says, Pete, I think uh, if you would uh, run a TV show on your own, I could get at least some of the uh, educational stations to carry it. So every two weeks, for 39 weeks, uh, Toshi and I went down to Newark, New Jersey, and tape recorded two shows. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky-tacky, little boxes, little boxes, little boxes, all the same. There's a green one and a pink one, and a blue one and a yellow one, and they're all made out of ticky-tacky, and they all look just the same. People we asked to be guests uh, were paid all of $50, <laughs> and uh, we helped to fund it. And when we ran out of cash, it was discontinued. But we did have some wonderful guests on it. Uh -huh. 
You ought to see my Cindy, she lives way down south. She's so sweet, the honeybees swarm around her mouth. Get along home, Cindy, Cindy, yeah, get along home, Cindy, Cindy, get along home, Cindy, Cindy, I'll marry you someday. My father never promoted folk music as a commercial entity. His promotion was solely around the uh, social importance of it, the way it could gather people together. But uh, commerciality was not in his game. His commerciality was an accident of people promoting him. I think many times throughout his career he wished it did not happen. But in order to spread the message, I think he put up with it. to Pete for We Shall Overcome to begin with. I mean, that's where I first heard it, and it was sort of, it was like a symbol. I only met Martin Luther King twice, very briefly, in 1957 at the Highlander Folk School. I was invited down to sing a few songs, and I sang a song called We Shall Overcome. Afterwards, a friend of mine drove Dr. King up to a speaking engagement in Kentucky, and she remembers him sitting in the back seat saying, we shall overcome. That song really sticks with you, doesn't it? I get too much credit for this song. I added a few verses, but everybody adds verses. I did add verses which a lot of others sing. We'll walk hand in hand. I also got people singing shall instead of will. One of the things that he brought to all movements was the idea of unity and people being together. That if, if you can be together, you can fight almost anything. We really saw Pete as a radical, and he actually brought a very deep knowledge base about the relationship between music and struggle that he just shared unendingly. Pete you know, played a, a constant role in the movement. Long before I was involved in anything having to do with civil rights, Pete Seeger was, was doing that. He uh, would appear at benefits for us. He would introduce us to others who would do benefits for us. Um, he was just always there. I don't think there was any political movement in history that had as much singing as the civil rights movement had. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the wall. And I think these pictures refute the people who say that uh, music is n just an attempt to make life livable. It's true, to a certain extent, that's one of the purposes of music. Help you survive your troubles. Help distract you from your troubles. But some music helps you understand your troubles. And as you see here, some music can help you do something about your troubles. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time passing. Where have all the flowers gone? Long time ago. Where have all the flowers gone? Girls have picked them, everyone. When will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? I think Pete Seeger was one of those that he wrote songs because he needed to. You know, at that time, music was about something, and it was about speaking out. I was looking at a newspaper and see American troops trying to wade waist deep across the Mekong River 
and a phrase sprang to my mind, waist deep in the big muddy, and the big fool says to push on. Pete Seeger had been kept off broadcast television for something like 17 years. Somewhere around 1967, Pete Seeger has another chance. The Smothers Brothers stuck their necks all the way out and invited Seeger on to sing. I said, well, I want Pete Seeger on the show, and CBS said, sure. They thought about it for a second, but they said, okay, fine. Well, by the time we get on, we were getting pretty heated about the war and, and, and being, becoming socially conscious, and of course, he, he was the biggest conscious in the world. And I sang several songs, including The Big Muddy, but when the show was put on the air, they'd scissored out that song. So I ran to the press right away. I said, oh, we're being censored. They're stopping Pete Seeger from singing. And so they put a big deal about it. Finally, after three months, I said, OK, OK. And in January, they allowed me to sing it. All at once, the moon clouded over. We heard a gurgling cry. A few seconds later, the captain's helmet was all that floated by. The sergeant said, turn around, men, I'm in charge from now on. And we just made it out of the big muddy with the captain dead and gone. We stripped and dived and found his body stuck in the old quicksand. I guess he didn't know that the water was deeper than the place he'd once before been. Another stream had joined the big muddy about a half mile from where he'd gone. We were lucky to escape from the big muddy when the big fool set to push on. There were millions watching, and that time I had a chance to sing the whole song. Well, I'm not going to point any moral, I'll leave that for yourself. Maybe you're still walking, you're still talking, you'd like to keep your health. But every time I read the paper, them old feelings come on. We're waist deep in the big muddy, the big fool says to push on. Waist deep in the big muddy, the big fool says to push on. Waist deep in the big muddy, the big fool says to push on. Waist deep, neck deep, soon even a tall man will be over his head. We're waist deep in the big muddy, the big fool says to push on. In 1972, my wife and I were invited to visit North Vietnam. We talked it over with our lawyer, we talked it over with others, and decided, now's the time. He wanted to stop the war, of course, and we had a group of people who really wanted to show us that Vietnam was a beautiful country and a friendly country and full of very smart and talented people. I first heard of Pete Seeger when I was uh, in Vietnam and found that he uh, visited our enemy in Hanoi. At that point, I became uh, quite upset, quite angry, and ashamed of the fact that Pete Seeger was from my hometown. Well, now that I announced last week that you're on my show, I don't want you to, I don't want it to hurt you or bother you, because it doesn't bother me. It's just I want these people to understand some way the crackpot letters that have been coming in, and there are quite a few, not, not a great percentage of the mail, but quite a few letters saying, how dare you, supposedly such a good American, have a communist like Pete Seeger on your TV show. If I hated USA, I would have left it long ago. Yeah. Pete, um, I've known you for quite a while. Many years, actually. And the Pete Seeger I know, and the Pete Seeger that June and I have come to love is, I said, one of the best Americans and patriots I've ever known. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle, The Vietnam War was a lie. We all know now, Gulf of Tonkin was a lie. And to sing for peace was to sing for a return to uh, sanity and justice.
They don't have the right weaponry. Bring on home, bring on home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring on home, home, home. And when they have few universal rules, bring on home, bring on home. So if you look your I just remember this story that you used to tell me, like every year or so, it's like being the repertoire stories you would tell me, and it would be, after this concert, this man came up to you, and he introduced himself, shook your hand, and said, Mr. Seeger, I came to kill you tonight. Interesting enough, that guy came from a small, small town in upstate, uh, and uh, he went into the army with all his friends, and some of his friends had gotten killed over there. And here I was singing songs uh, about pulling out of Vietnam, and he was simply outraged. And everyone was startled that knew that he was saying these things. That's when I said that when you, you know, was going to give him just the normal after concert shake, I said, you have to talk to him, you have to sit down and talk to him. We sat down, and mainly we sang Where Have All the Flowers Gone yeah. Together. And I remember him saying, he says, I feel clean. Yeah. Because he had been filled with such, such hate. He was crying. They thanked him for changing his mind. He came there to kill him that night. And he listened to the concert and he was so moved that he couldn't do it. It really was the bridge that allowed the rest of us to become um, activists and meld political music. So I think that's his greatest gift, was shepherding songs of peace and justice and celebrating what's really important about humans being um, loving and caring for each other. In the time of Vietnam, uh, when you see how long that went on, and there were um, so many people against it and what changed the government's mind and what they did about that was the people um, and music started that. The peats of the world and the hundreds of thousands of people who protested and sang and marched and sat in and got arrested. That's why that war finally ended and nothing to do with the president. He didn't want it to end. I really love this country. But if somebody says, well, you were against the Vietnam War, you're anti-American. I say, was Lincoln against America when he voted against the Mexican War? Was Mark Twain against America when he made speeches against the Spanish-American War in 1898? No, if you love your country, you'll find ways somehow to speak out to do what you think is right. Sailing up my dirty stream Still I love it and I'll keep the dream Forty years ago, the Hudson River was like Dodge City. Uh, you could do pretty much anything you wanted. Sewage contamination, oil contamination. The federal government declared the Hudson an industrialized river. And so um, government not only made pollution possible and didn't try and stop it, they, they virtually declared the Hudson River as a place where it should take place. About that time, a friend of mine said, Pete, you know, they used to have sailboats on the Hudson with a boom 70 feet long. And I said to my friend, why don't we get some people together and build a replica of one of these boats? He loved to gather people together and to find a boat that he could actually have an audience on, you know, big enough to sing with these people on the boat. I think he liked that idea. Three years later, the sloop Clearwater was launched. It 
was also about this time that I met a biologist, René Dubos. He worked at the Rockefeller Institute. And he said, if anybody asks you where in the world is the most important place, tell them right where you are. You can think globally, but act locally. Pete wants to clean up the river. Everybody says, Pete, you can't clean up the river. The river's too big. There's not enough people. Nobody's going to help you. Blah, 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 blah. That didn't stop Pete. Except we thought, well, I think we need to build a, a sloop. And we'll sail it up and down the river. And people will come to the river to see the sloop. And they'll look down and say, look, there's shit in the river. We have to do something. And everybody said, Pete, it's not really a great idea. It's not going to work. But you know what? Of course it worked. One more time, sailing up, sailing up, sailing down, sailing down, up, down, down, down up and down, down the river, sailing on, stopping all along the way. The river may be dirty now, but she's getting cleaner every day. He made a promise to me when I was about 12 years old, and he said, when you grow up, you're going to be able to swim in the river. <laughs> and he did. I was sort of surprised. Uh, we were the first uh, organization in the Hudson River Valley that actively went out and hands-on investigated polluters. It took a while, but the obvious thing that happened was we cleaned up the river and began uh, a whole era where the people who live here began to really see what it was and, and appreciate it for what it is. No, it wasn't just legislation and it wasn't just writing laws. It was fun stuff like being down on the river and dancing and music and food and festivals. The Great Hudson River Revival that Clearwood puts on every year grew from an annual event that attracted a, a couple of thousand people to an annual event that attracts tens of thousands of people. And Give it one more try. To learn to share what's been given to me and you. One blue sky above us. People like me want to keep the rivers clean, the air safe to breathe, and the waters safe to drink. And we found a way to take school kids out now for 36 years. And the kids go back to school three hours later, and some of them have had their lives changed. We've all got to be involved in trying to put this world together. I think if the world is put together, it's not going to be done by big organizations. It's going to be done by millions upon millions of little organizations, often local. Pete was a, a controversial figure, and I don't know that Pete and I uh, shared similar politics 40 years ago, uh, but uh, Pete was a master. Uh, at finding common cause with people. He did it with his music, he did it with his songs, and he did it with the Hudson River. The cause that uh, he has championed for these past decades is one that uh, I believe in tremendously. It's like his, his, uh, his little banjo slogan, this mach machine surrounds hate and forces it to surrender. Uh, that's what his music did. His music surrounded you know, all that, uh, that political hate in the Hudson River Valley and forced it to surrender. You got to walk that lonesome valley. You got to walk it by yourself. Ain't nobody here can walk it for you. You got to walk it by yourself. Now, even if you never heard the song before, you could sing it with me. Could you just repeat after me? Try it. Oh, you got to walk. You got to walk that lonesome valley, that lonesome valley. You got to walk, you got to walk it by yourself. Nobody here can walk it for you. You got to walk it by yourself. Now some people are singing real good, but there's still some people I can see them out there. 
been living in Washington too long. He grew up with a definite sense of bringing music to the people, and that's what he's always been trying to do. His thing has always been to get people to sing at his concerts. He doesn't want to hear himself sing. He wants to hear the people sing, and in many of his recordings, he always wants the, the voice of the audience boosted so uh, it can be heard on the record. That's very important. The best music I've ever been ever made in my life has been when I can get the folks, all of them, young, old, conservative, liberal, radical, get them all singing on the chorus. He was an inconvenient artist who dared to sing things as he saw them. He was attacked for his beliefs. He was banned from television. Some artists make musical history. Pete Seeger made history with his music. The, the government, which so cruelly tried to silence him in the 50s, ended up giving him the uh, highest in the world. Oh, how times change. Pete, thank you for your courage, your inspiration, and giving the world this wonderful song to sing. To everything, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to reap, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to laugh, a time to weep. Everybody sing it. To everything, is a season, and a time. The fact that we got the Kennedy Center honor, it's not just ironic. It proves something. It proves the metaphor of turn, 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 that there's a time for everything. There's a time for hate and there's a time for love. He, he went through all this time of hate uh, and finally at a certain point of his, in his life it was recognized that it was all done out of love. And Pete walks out. Carnegie Hall, and that crowd just spontaneously arises. It's not just because he's showing up, it's because he means something. Yo soy un hombre sincero De donde crecen las palmas Yo soy un hombre sincero De donde crecen las palmas Y antes de morir me quiero Echar mis versos de la alma Canta, canta la mera we played Carnegie Hall about once a year. He doesn't think he can do it anymore, but the last time, it was great. He, he was pretty on fire that night. Mi verso es un verde claro Y de un verde claro 
y de un carmín encendido. Mi verso es un siervo herido que busca en el monte amparo. Guantanamera, Guajira, Guantanamera. The words say with Oh don't tell me at age 84 I can't remember the translation I am a truthful man from this land of palm trees before dying I share these poems of my soul My verses are light green but they are also flaming red And the last verse says, with the poor people of this world, I want to cast my lot. For the last several years, Pete's been telling me that he's losing his voice. But when I saw him at Carnegie Hall, I was like everybody else. I just wanted Pete to be up there. He gave his voice to uh, the things in which he believed. And All he has to do for me is stand up there and hit that instrument, tell us what the song is, and play along with us. I've never sung anywhere without giving the people listening to me a chance to join in. As a kid, as a lefty, as a man touring USA and the world, as an oldster, I guess it's kind of a religion with me. Participation. That's what's going to save the human race. As I go walking that freedom highway, nobody living can make me turn back. Nobody living can make me turn back. This land was made for you. One more time. This land is your land. This land is my land. I still prefer to sing in schools than almost any other single place. You can't feel completely like giving up if you see all those little faces. You can't say there's no hope. Gotta keep trying. This time is the approach towards song as viewing it, its potential to reach people and touch people's lives and and change the world in the sense that, you know, was was something that he had a deep belief in and he's pursued it his entire life. To my old brown earth And to my old blue sky I'll now give these last few molecules of I And you who sing And you who stand nearby I do charge you not to cry Guard well our human chain Watch well you keep it strong As long as sun will shine and this our home keep 
pure and sweet and green For now I'm yours And you are also mine Once upon a time, wasn't singing a part of everyday life as much as talking, physical exercise, and religion? Our distant ancestors, wherever they were in this world, sang while pounding grain, paddling canoes, or walking long journeys. Can we begin to make our lives once more all of a piece? Finding the right songs and singing them over and over is a way to start. And when one person taps out a beat while another leads into the melody, or when three people discover a harmony they never knew existed, or a crowd joins in on a chorus as though to raise the ceiling a few feet higher, then they also know there is hope for the world. This land of the free Bring them home Bring them home Bring all troops back from overseas Bring, bring them home, home Bring them home. home So if you love this land of the free Bring them home Bring them home Bring all troops back from overseas Bring them home PBS, 